We worship this morning according to the abbreviated communion service, beginning on page 15 in the front of the hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our Old Testament lesson in our continuing study of the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20 beginning at verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. He rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So far the Old Testament lesson. Our psalm of the day, these words of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So far the psalm of the day. Our epistle lesson is from Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. When you were dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel is written in the 11th chapter according to St. Matthew, beginning at the 25th verse. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son, those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us join in confessing our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed, as printed on page 18 in the front of the hymn. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text from Exodus chapter 20, as we continue our study of the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Here is the commandment as God gave it to his people Israel. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. If 
you have ever read the latter chapters of Exodus or the books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, then you know that God placed around his Old Testament people a fence, a hedge, a wall of rules, dietary regulations, ceremonies, sacrificial offerings and obligations. The Old Testament had within it in the Code of Moses civil laws that governed Israel as a nation, ceremonial laws that governed their worship life, moral laws which defined and distinguished right and wrong. All of these laws and regulations were binding upon God's Old Testament people, Israel. He separated them by these laws set them apart as the cradle, as the incubator of the coming Christ. And having done so, he pointed them ahead to one who was coming. In all the smoking altars of Israel, in all of the bleating lamb, in all of the ceremonies and sacrifices and laws of cleanness and uncleanness, in the sacrificial Passover lamb, in Yom Kippur, the great day of atonement, in the Sabbath days of rest, were foreshadowed the coming of the one who would lift from us the burden of our sins and to bear them away to a bloody cross. Now all of this poses a question. How can we, who claim to go by the Bible, toss out all of those regulations about kosher foods and various ceremonies and Old Testament obligations how can we simply throw all of that out and yet insist that something like, for instance, the fourth commandment that says, honor your father and mother, that this is valid for all believers of all times? Simply put, we don't have to decide that. Jesus and his inspired apostles already settled that. What we usually call the moral law, the unchanging will of God for all people of all time, no matter where they are. As it is set down in the New Testament, these things remain for us unchanged. So for instance, the Ten Commandments, as they are repeated, and explained in the wording of the New Testament, give us a handy summary of what God's unchanging will for all people of all time is. The other things, the civil and ceremonial elements, the Sabbath day ceremonies and sacrifices, these are all done away with. They are completed in Christ. So that as St. Paul says in Colossians from our epistle lesson today, these were a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So there is no New Testament Sabbath day as such. Sunday is not the New Testament Sabbath day in the sense that God has commanded worship on one particular day with no physical labor to be done on that day. That was all fulfilled in Christ who bore the burden of our sins. Christians, for the last 2,000 years, in their liberty, have pretty much agreed in most places to meet and worship on Sunday to honor the resurrection of Christ on that day. 
or for that matter, the birthday of the Christian church on a Sunday, on the day of Pentecost. But that does not mean it's a sin to worship on Monday, Wednesday, or Thursday. In that we have freedom. So setting aside what was only intended for Israel and only until Christ came, what does the third commandment have to say to you and me? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you nor your son or daughter nor your manservant or maidservant nor your animals nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Long ago, when God completed his perfect world with perfect people, the Bible tells us, and so by the seventh day, God had finished all the work he had been doing. So he rested on the seventh day from all his work. And the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now surely the eye and keeper of Israel who neither slumbers nor sleeps does not get weary nor worn out. But on that seventh day it is as though God steps back from his newly created world, celebrates it, dedicates it, consecrates it as a special creation Sabbath in which he is now finished with his creative work. Oh, he continues to maintain the world he has created. He hears our prayers. He is actively involved in our lives. But he now has ceased or rested from that creative activity of making the whole universe. Later, God would point back to that creation Sabbath day as a pattern for the Sabbath law that he gave to the people of Israel as his special people. And of course, that Sabbath law of the Old Testament like all the other ceremonies and sacrifices, pointed ahead to the one who would lift from us the unbearable burden of our sins, to the one who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And then later, the New Testament tells us, There remains therefore a rest a Sabbath rest for the people of God. You and I know that ultimate Sabbath rest by another name. Heaven. So Luther explains God's will in this commandment this way. We should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching and his word, but regard it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. To despise something you really don't have to do anything. You can do nothing. You can despise something or someone by simply ignoring them, pretending they don't exist, as though they're not worth the time of day. You simply despise them. You do nothing. It's worth nothing to you. You don't even think about it. We, of course, all understand that church attendance has largely declined throughout our country and across the board. We understand that most people today in the so-called postmodern age are into kind of a do-your-own-thing when it comes to the faith. As of the year 2012, 20% of all people in our country classify themselves as 
atheists, agnostics, or simply unaffiliated with any particular religion. And another study says that by the year 2041, all religion will have disappeared. Jesus, of course, said otherwise. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church, and his word will never pass away. But that being the case, Jesus himself did warn us that the time would come when the hearts of many would grow cold. St. Paul said the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed, you remember it, don't you? It is largely a tragedy. It is the story of how the seed of the divine word is often plucked up from the fields of human hearts by predatory birds, blasted by the hot sun, tangled up and choked by thorns. Only in a few cases does the seed of the word mercifully sprout up in human hearts and bear fruit. Now, two gladly hear the word of God, who gladly hear and learn, is the opposite of to despise it. And of course, to gladly do something is a lot different than the way going to God's house has become for people, which is sort of a, a burden to be born an obligation to be met. And so it becomes this thing that we must do. This thing that we must jump through the hoop on in order to please God. And then all of the joy gets sucked right out of it. Now none of it has to do with what God is doing for us. It has to do with what we are doing for God. I spent a year in the 1970s in my vicar year preaching in an inner city church. One of the few churches left that still had every Sunday German services in addition to the two English ones. Out on the church sign was what the German service, of course, was called. Some of you old-timers might even remember. Gottesdienst. God's service. That, the, the God's service to us. And that changed the whole way you think about worship or the Word and the sacraments. It's about what God does for us. I'm going to get into a long lecture on church attendance. You people are here this morning, you're attending, why preach to the choir? There's a time and a place for that. But even we who attend church regularly, we can do it out of kind of a, a dogged sense of duty or because it's a family habit and it's what we do. And that's when all the joy gets sucked out of it. When we forget that here in the Word and sacraments, God is serving us. He is doing something for us. Here He lifts the burdened heart. He pours down peace upon embattled lives. He rescues us from the toil of our guilt gives to us a rest that only He can give. We may come to God's house or open the pages of His book and we find ourselves, well, it's one more time bandit on my to-do list and I should really do this. And so we sit in church and we find ourselves watching the watch or the clock to find out, well, I got other things to do. And our mind goes to other obligations that need to be met in my life. And all the while, I'm not letting God give me rest. 
and take from me the burden. It isn't that the word has no power anymore to reach human hearts. It's that we fail to catch the spirit of Mary and Be- Mary of Bethany who sat at Jesus' feet with thirsty ears and a hungry heart to take in the words of the Master because it lifted this great burden. God wanted to do something for her. We read some verses from Psalm 1 today. He talked about how the righteous person delights in the law, the word of God. The word of God, law and gospel. And how the righteous person meditates on God's word. Day and night. Because it is this burden lifting thing God does for us. What do you think of when you hear that word meditate? Think of a Buddhist monk sitting there with legs crossed going, hmm. Or do you think of some new age mysticism where you're getting in touch with your own thoughts and contemplating your own psychological belly button? Or some higher communion with God all in the name of some sort of higher Christian meditation? Nah. All true Christian meditation meditates on God's Word. There is no true Christian meditation apart from simply paying attention to what God has said in the Word and the sacraments. Any other type of so-called meditation is a lot of pretentious piety, sanctimonious nonsense, More about that word meditate. Meditates on it day and night. The word meditate is really kind of too tame of a word. The Hebrew word for that in the Bible is, you know, to to kind of mumble and talk over it and repeat it and say it out loud. You know when you're trying to concentrate on something and you might just slow down and you actually read it out loud so it comes out of your mouth and into your ear, that type of mumbling over it and talking. Slow down, meditate, God is talking. You know that this Hebrew word for meditate is the same word that Isaiah uses when he talks about a lion growling over its prey. Think of this. Think of a hungry lion chomping, munching, growling contentedly over its catch on the Serengeti Plain in Africa. Now, think about your dog. The way your dog simply crunches, savors, delights in, Slobber is all over his bone that you gave him. And don't try to take it away. That's the word that is used for meditate. To simply feed and enjoy and savor the word of God. Because you're really hungry for this. It's what God told the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament and the apostle John in the book of Revelation. The angel in the vision said, take this book and eat it. The church fathers picked up on this in the older version of the prayer for the word in the liturgy. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. 
This is not strange language to us. When someone's enthusiastic about a subject, we say, man, they really eat that up. Or you got someone who really likes to read, and you say, man, that guy just devours books. Jesus talked about our faith in terms of eating in his famous sermon on the bread of life. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy is not simply a commandment of the law to you. It is an invitation to you. God is doing something for you, not you for God. Gottes deeds, God's service to you and to me. In the third commandment, God is simply saying, Eat up. Faith simply says, boy, I can't get enough of this. And then, what if it's true that we are what we eat? Amen. peace of God which surpasses all understanding. So keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us offer up our prayers for Artis Urbanic, who has returned home from the hospital following surgery, and for our teacher, Mr. Justin Wickman, who is undergoing medical tests. We pray, O Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on your servants in their illnesses. 
Continue to restore their strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with them. Bless the medical means employed on their behalf with your healing power. We commit them to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and merciful God for Jesus' sake, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the communion portion of the service, beginning on the top of page 23 in the front of the hymn. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith, a new life everlasting. Depart in peace.
Savior, Jesus Christ. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, strengthen and preserve you with the true faith, a new life everlasting, be part in peace.
Let us pray. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.